And if there's anybody just in the, um, in the councillor's lounge, if anybody could just pop their head in the councillor's lounge for me. And are we it? There's no one else in the... Do we know... Do we know where anyone else is? Who's missing? Holly's on the phone. Right? OK. I think... All right. Well, then, I think we'll go on, provided there isn't anybody just at hand who could be called. No? James has gone to check. And so that brings us to... Thank you. No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. It brings us to item 11 on page 59, which is the community occupancy leave. Leases. What? Oh, no. Sorry. Go oh, backwards. Rewind. We're going to page 11. So I've forgotten we hadn't done that before the gardens. Um, this will be a very quick thing, not much to say on it. So Chair's report, page 11. Um, I'll just take it as read. Somebody to move it. Councillor Casson, Councillor Henry to the mo second it. Thank you. It is, it is what it is. I don't think there are any particular questions. There are questions. No, Council sorry, sorry, I'm not. Mine is uh, more a comment. I don't know. I'll wait and see if there's any questions. If, any if questions on this item? Councillor Gallagher. No I okay, any questions? No, or I'll take your comment, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Paula. Yeah, look, I just wanted to um, just make a comment about the Hamilton Central City S uh, Safety Strategy Perception Survey, and particularly point number 16. Wait, next report. We're on my, my report. Oh, sorry, sorry. No problem. I'm oh. getting excited. Hold that thought. Councillor Gallagher, have you got a quest, uh, comment on my report? Oh, oh. Yeah, brief comment. Sure. Uh, just obviously, um, I just want to note as part of the, our civic light of this committee, the uh, Hillcrest High School um, put on a social science, social studies students put on a very brilliant uh, display uh, around um, a range of issues. Um, the one particular panel I want to draw our attention to, and I think you circulated at Councillor Paula, was the, the issue around green space in, yes. in urban Hamilton. and. Why I raise that here and thank the students uh, for doing a very good presentation on that. There was lots of good presentations that day, very relevant. That one is relevant to us moving ahead with our, um, because it really ties into the issue of our urban intensification. And we've got the stats now that we're about one of the most, if not, we're the highest potential density uh, cities within our boundaries. Mm -hmm. And in some cases where we're having uh, urban intensification and infill, we still need to keep a running uh, observation on access to uh, green space, an open community space. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean to say it's just council provided green space. It's obviously being acutely aware of, of, of the um, schools and, 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 and um, who can provide that green space. But I just okay. wanted perhaps to note and, and ask through the GM as part of your report, yes. I think. So we won't take too much more time off well, this. Well, I won't all I just want to quickly acknowledge is, you know, the students made a marvellous presentation, but they that did. particular theme I would like to pursue with the general so, manager. So, thank you. And you did mention, uh, Martin, yeah. men, um, Councillor Gallagher mentioned this to me just before the chair's report and asked me for you to include it, but That's actually right. it had it, just, I just finished it. So yeah, it's you'd gone, finished so it's a timing yeah. issue. Yeah. But what we will do is get the, um, a co I've got a photo of the board, but we'll mm. try and get our hands mm. on the actual board, because it was a lovely mm. board, and mm. see if we can get the students to share with us some of their thinking I, I think, in the new year. It was lovely. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I think that'd be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, moved and seconded, all in favor. Oh, apologies. Councillor McPherson. Sorry, I actually want to agree with you. So. You moved too fast. <laughs> the uh, co your comments on the route to the town centre and the good community engagement and councillor engagement too, actually more than we've ever had, I think, in my experience on that sort of thing. But um, maybe the lesson to draw from that, because we've come in part way through, is to get in it for peacocks and then in future Rotakauri mm. before any th land sold to any developer in terms of particular sites, so that our designs and the community's designs can be the very first thing off the block rather than the second thing. Yeah, thank you, I agree. I very much um, liked the community-led approach that we were seeing there. I think we should replicate that. Thank you, everyone. All in favour? Aye. Opposed? Carried. That brings us on to the uh, General Manager's report now on page 13, item 7. 
Uh, it's just two things in there, Madam Chair. I'll take it as read. Um, it should be Lake Rotoroa, not Lake Rotatua water quality. Um, just for clarification there, it's a bit of a typo. Um, Maria is here to answer any questions on the water quality issue, and uh, Debbie and Kelvin Powell are here to answer any questions on the, the perception survey. Okay, thank you. So we'll take some questions. Um, first up, Mangai Tapora. Um, Do you want to, just in case there's questions, we'll just bring staff to the, so you can see them if you need to. <coughs> Thank you. So, so I note in the report that there's a raised social concern around the growing rate of poverty. Um, and given the fear about the begging and the homelessness, what are we doing to address this as a wider concern? That's the first question. And the second question is, um, have we explored what has happened in the past 12 months around the perceptions of um, safety? So I note the comparative data and that there has been an increase in the sense of you know, overall thoughts of being safe um, and a reduction in those that said they felt unsafe or relatively unsafe. But actually there's been a drop in the last 12 months, according to this comparative data. What has happened in the last 12 months to, um, you know, are there events or things like that that have occurred? And the last question is, in what manner has iwi been engaged to support Safer Spaces initiatives? What? Safer Spaces oh, initiatives, initiatives for Hamilton. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillors, uh, Mangai, um, I, three questions there I interpreted what you said. And yeah. if, I, if I deal with the second question first, um, and that was more to do with, if I just, a little bit of context, there are, the, the, the GM's report reference there refers to three differing uh, perception surveys. Yeah which have in fact returned differing results. Yep. So I just being clear on which, was there a specific survey you're referring to? The, the, uh, okay, the yep. perceptions, of survey, perceptions of safety survey that we have done each year, that's we being HCC for the last four years, has shown a drop in both day and night time perceptions of safety. Yes. However, the methodology is slightly different from this year, okay. and, and we can explain that. The, um, the one from the business uh, perceptions of safety, that is their own survey, and that is the best rating or the one with the least level of concern from the business community. So it's the highest we've rated is, is this year. And then there is the quality of life survey, which is the biannual survey done across the top eight cities in the country, mm. noting that Hamilton didn't take part in that in 2012 and 2014, and we've shown a 9% improvement in people's perceptions of safety in the central city. Yeah. So I'm referring to the public perception, the um, City Council survey from page 19, 20 to 21. First major change is, is previously when we have uh, presented this to council, there's been a challenge as to whether or not we were the methodology was correct, as in we were going out and surveying people who were using the public spaces mm. during the day or night. And the challenge to us was, was that adequately capturing a wider community view because we were using a captured community only where we were seeking the survey. This year it's been a, we used a different method, a wider methodology, including putting it out on a across social media on Facebook to try and reach a wider target audience. Yes. So um, we are now capturing people who potentially mm. do not come into the central city. That's great. Sorry, now I've forgotten what your first question was. <laughs> I might have forgotten too what the first question was. And so the first question was the um, addressing the wider concerns around um, begging and, and homelessness. Sure. I mean, I'm not sure that I'm going to adequately answer your question. It's, it's a really complex social issues, and it's not one... Sorry? Yeah. That we're going to... 
deal on their own. What we are is we're part of a wide collaborative effort um, initiated through the People's Project. Uh, and I, Andy and I are, and are both on the governance and, and, and Councillor Angela chairs that governance board. So we, we are tightly connected with all of the uh, major uh, government agencies uh, and providers uh, and Waikato Tainui as part of that and um, we're looking at collaborative responses. Now that goes from planning, it goes for uh, joint outreach activity, it goes for better publicity and education, uh, it goes across a wide range of areas. And, and City Safe is part of that in terms of a visible deterrent and presence as well. Excellent. So, a few words, Debbie, but what I was going to suggest if it's helpful is because there is a lot that sits behind those questions. They're very good questions, but it might be useful for staff to have a, a targeted briefing with you uh, for the Mangai Māori around what, what has been done uh, under the task force group that Angela was chairing, et cetera, and at a staff level, because, because I think it is a, such an important area, and you're right on with your questions are really, really pertinent. Uh, I think we're only going to scratch the surface with any answer mm. today, given the time. Would that be? I think even alluding to the attempt for um, that, for the work that's going to be done um, around the area, the briefing would be good. But I've back read all of the council minutes and yeah. all of the other strategies that have. So come you're looking at this. what the directives going yeah. forward are. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to make a brief? Not a full that? answer. Just what's the intent. Yeah, I guess what m might not come through in the agendas and minutes is the collaborative stuff that happens yeah. outside of council, so that might be quite good to brief you on that, and perhaps Angela might like to join us for that and add her. Yeah, yes. that probably would be a, a worthwhile yeah. endeavour. Yeah, thank you. Does that, does that, yes. is that okay for this point in time? Or? Sorry. Yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you. Councillor Casson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Kelvin and Debbie, for your continuing work. Um, just got a couple of questions, and it's on the um, perception of safety, um, and particularly the uh, per perception of safety in the central city on page 20 graph, where obviously the people feeling unsafe have overtaken the people feeling safe there. Um, but I, I do realise you've had a few um, different um, surveys out there. I've got a couple here, um, and I acknowledge that City Safe do a pretty good job with what, the, what powers they have which is none, <laughs> um, if this council was brave enough to increase... Um, sorry, I'll put it to you. If this council was brave enough to increase funding for city safe and safety measures for our city to allow you to employ more city safe staff, would that allow you to provide more services to the public and especially to the suburbs to try and get that perception of safety um, turned around the other way? If there were more staff available, uh, we could provide a wider range of service, um, certainly targeting um, the suburban areas, which are not particularly well catered mm. for at present. Okay. Um, the second one, and again with that graph, um, and with the graph on page uh, 17, where obviously public, public places are um, high on the agenda, and especially Garden Place. So it kind of goes to um, SIPTED, crime prevention through environmental design, which includes design of things and also can include lighting. Um, and uh, I've, I've known with policing uh, during my time that Garden Place has been a fairly, uh, perceived to be an unsafe place at night time. Would better lighting in Garden Place or Civic Square lead to better perception of safety in the public? Undoubtedly, there is a strong correlation between perceptions of safety, actual safety, and enhanced and improved lighting. So right. the answer is yes. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Mallet. Thank you. Um, my questions are regarding Lake Rotoroa uh, water quality, uh, paragraphs four to nine on page 13. Um, so just so... To, to be clear, I understand what you're reporting back is that we don't, we've done some work, we've got some data, but we haven't analysed the data, so we haven't had any response. We've got no, um, nothing to report, but simply because we haven't got the results back yet. Um, yes, so <coughs> it's, it's important for us to know what the main source of the bacteria is yep. so that we can then figure out what to do about it. Okay. 
Um, is this the first, I, I was on, I think I was on the um, uh, task force that worked on this um, in the previous triennium. Uh, is this the first bit of work that's come from that? I would have you make your mind up? check the reference. Um, I was, wasn't involved in that task force, so I'll have to get back to you. Okay, no, because there was a lot of stuff we did out of that, and it's just this has just tweaked my memory that we actually had the thing. Mm. Um, I just wonder, uh, we are responsible for the water quality, HCC? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. So, okay, so what sort of... Uh, there are some dates May next year. Uh, we're expecting to get some reports back. Or is that when you're going to talk to Restore? So you're still working with Restore? Yes. Okay. Okay. Have we got any indication of what this has cost so far? Um, so the testing has been done in partnership with the Waikato University, who've been testing the fish. Um, to check for heavy metals. The um, Waikato Regional Council have been testing for bacteria types and NIWA regularly tests to see if bacteria is a present. So they cover the cost of that testing and we'll be covering the cost of the um, ESR testing. And uh, again, I have to report back on the price of that. We're waiting for them to confirm. Okay, you, you brought up Waikato Regional Council. So what's the overlap between us and them? Or is there an overlap? Um, so they obviously have an interest in water quality, um, so that lake is fed by stormwater catchment. So they would have an interest from that perspective. Okay, so... And so do the River Authority, because it's, uh, um, it drains into the Waikato River. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so is there too many chefs in the kitchen? Why is, is it quite clear where we, what our work is and what their responsibilities are? Because they all sound like the same. They're all talking about water quality. Um, yes, it is clear. <laughs> so um, Unlike the water. <laughs> we all have an interest. Um, I guess the regional council would look at it from a regulatory point of view. So if there was something wrong, um, mm. they would um, talk to us about that. So why um, haven't they done this sort of testing? They have. Uh, the truth is, truth, truth. Okay, is so that, why have we done it? Well, the truth is that we need a collaborative um, um, arrangement between WRC, Restore, and NIWA, who have been boots and all in this. They've been given data for many years, NIWA, and the Waikato Regional Council, and ourselves, because we manage the reserve and everything around the lake and what flows into the lake. Waikato Regional Council has um, an issue with uh, waters, water bodies that feed into the Waikato River, as does the River Authority. Um, they're also concerned with water pollution. They've been involved in the um, trial and establishment of artificial wetlands. They've been involved in the removal of whatever that plant is at the back, the lily thing. Uh, and lots of other trials to try and improve the water quality. In the LTP, you'll remember that a group... OK, I guess you're just group. reinforcing my question about why are two entities doing the same thing? There's because two, we have two, to work together two layers to of statutory responsibility. So we have responsibilities yeah. under the Reserves Act. Yep. And they have responsibilities under the Resource Management Act. Yeah. And are there, but those 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 two sets of responsibilities seem to, and I might be just don't understand this. They do overlap, seem to be yes. um, converging on one set of activities. So why don't we do the same? Why doesn't one group do the That's same? That's why a collaborative approach has been taken. Okay. All right, I'm just very aware of how... In and there's another overlay, is um, the River Authority and Tainui are interested in um, the water quality, mm -hmm. and they, I've just been contacted recently about having some discussions early in the new year about um, once we get the analysis done of what is the problem, then obviously jumping to what is the solution, and they're, okay. they're keen to discuss um, their involvement in that, along with Waikato Regional Council and Hamilton City Council. Okay. And Maria, does, it's fair does this to say, work? Isn't it, once we get the the problem definition, we'll then drill down to who does what bit. We might do some stormwater work. They might do some eco restoration, depending on what the report says. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Does this does this work fall out of that um, lake um, task force, or is it just something we have to do because we're Somewhat, we are somewhat the regulatory authority or something? A little bit of both. 
Um, so there has been general interest in improving the lake quality. So restorers, are obviously, a group set up, they have a specific interest in restoring the quality mm. at that particular site. Um, and as council, we have an obligation to do so as well. Okay. It's an action of the management plan and we're required to under the Reserves Act just intrinsically to look after the natural resources. Okay. So who's running the Lake Rotoroa management plan? So that is like any of the other management plans um, and it's administered by the parks team. Didn't hear what you said. Um, so it sits with the parks and recreation team. Okay. So what's the update on it? How far have we got with it? In terms of the wider management plan? Well, in or terms of the set of activities or actions that came out of that, what, what, where are we at? Um, so we have been working with the events team to look at opportunities to enhance the space um, for events at that space. Um, mm -hmm. we, the veranda lease came back with reference to the management plan mm -hmm. and now the lake water quality is coming back. So have you got a list of the actions and res resolutions that we made and those things are being followed up and being completed? Yep, I can circulate that for you. Right. After Thank you, that would be good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Mallet. <coughs> Councillor Pascoe. Yes, thanks, Chair. <coughs> I'll start. My first. Qu my questions are around the uh, city safety um, strategy. So you can come back now, Calvin. Uh, Maria can leave. <coughs> and and my first question is probably follows on from Councillor Mallet's because it seems to me uh, that there are two, maybe three surveys being done on perception, which in itself is a pretty subjective. Um, sort of outcome showing quite different results. Is there a way that we can merge them together and have one and maybe save some costs of all three groups doing those separate surveys coming back with different results? The quality of life survey, as I said, is the national one done across the top eight largest uh, cities in the country and it's comparing like for like data across those. So a, a decision was taken by the council not to participate for two year, uh, four years in that, hence why we set up at the start of the, uh, at the, start of the city safe operation and, and the launch of the uh, central city safety plan, the original one in 2014, there was no measure or process in place, so we set up to do that. The one that's administered by, and it's administered and run by the uh, HCBA, is purely looking at the, because at that, at that point in time, there were some very strong views held by the business community about, about the impact this was having, okay. and so this was simply about as a, as, a, as a standalone tracking how they were feeling in terms of what they were seeing, seeing and their perceptions around that. So it's not measuring the same thing. So I hate to think we were measuring like for like yeah, across okay. those. It seems to be when you read that there is a little bit of that. Um, will, will they continue with this, given that if you look on page 16, top of page 16, where they have the not a problem through to a serious problem, uh, none of the results go beyond a minor problem, do they? There's nothing there that's over to... Well, that, that's actually a good thing. I think... Oh, yeah, no, no, I'm saying it and, is, yeah. And I, I, I would like to think that we will carry on... Uh, well, that's over to them, but I would like to think that they will carry on measuring that okay. um, because that's an, an indicator for us if that starts to change... Uh, and I'd hate for us to not be picking up on those signs and signals. OK, so do we continue with our survey if they're going to continue with, with theirs? So. I would take a little bit of convincing that after four years we should just throw it out now. We, we've, we, we've, we've got some, some history in terms of being able to look at uh, how this is trending. Uh, if it's it, The reason to do it was to be able to report back to council with a little bit of clarity. Uh, if the view of council is, is that that's no longer required, um, we, we, we could certainly consider um, disbanding it. Okay. Thank you. And the second question is around the, uh, the lighting in the, in the main street. Is it fair to say that that's being addressed now by the 
new LED lights that will be installed in January. The un under porch, as I understand, they're going under those porches along Victoria Street and around the other central city streets. Correct. So the under veranda LED project will definitely improve lighting around the edges, but um, I think the lighting that um, Councillor Kasson was referring to was in Civic Square and Garden Place in the middle, where yeah, there aren't okay. currently any lights, and the LED project won't improve that situation. Okay. So we don't know where the where the concerns were, whether the concerns were in Garden Place or under the porch lights. You know, I understand there's still bulbs and so forth, isn't there? And some of them are quite poorly. Some of the porches, porch lights are quite poorly, poorly lit with old bulbs. Under the free text commentary por portion of the <coughs> perception survey, uh, which I've been through all those, the overwhelming commentary was about poor lighting in Garden Place. Okay, thank you. OK, Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hi, Calvin. <laughs> hi, Debbie. Just a couple of questions on the uh, perception results for 2018. So thank you for acknowledging that the methodology is different. So my concerns are around how we're going to uh, explain that to the public. Um, so when... Uh, when we change, because we've changed the methodology, we can't rely on the trend data. So how, in the past we've done the scorecards, um, how are you going to deliver this information to the public for the next, what was the new strategy, three years? In the same format as the scorecard or, some, or something different? Or just like this? It would be my intention to deliver it in a scorecard. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, they are still the perception results that, that were obtained, albeit the methodology is slightly different. Uh, that's still the results. I mean, the, the thing is that actually, for me, it's about the opportunity to engage the community in the discussion about how do we collaboratively and collectively um, impart an impact on safety across our community. Yeah, you're preaching to the choir, you know that. <laughs> no, I understand that, and perception is key, because perception is reality. But w to rely and make decisions in the future on trend data where there's a point in time where that methodology has fundamentally changed, because we used to, uh, we used to survey people in the space, now we're serving people out of the space. So the while they're both perceptions, they're vastly different and, and fully supportive of either. But I think then, are you planning to do something to just capture that? Because it's it's not good practice to. Yeah, so I not think we could capture that in the commentary around the scorecard and just put a footnote mm. in there. And then we would be making sure that um, going forward that the methodology stays the same. But I think it is better practice to survey. Wider. Yeah, I'm not. So I'm not. So I'm fully supportive of it. It was to make an it. improvement. Fully, yeah. fully supportive of, and it was Councillor Bunting that raised it in the in the safety work groups. Fully supportive of that. My my only concern is that when we is that any decisions made following trend data, it's like we flicked a switch and we're changing the methodology. And anyone proficient in research, more proficient in research and stuff than I am, would that would be marked somewhere. That would be noted and and quite upfront. I think it needs to be. So um, now, the, but the business survey is the same methodology, correct? It's correct. Nothing's yeah. changed. That's administered by yeah. HCBA. So, so again, that probably does um, uh, illustrate what I, really what what I'm seeking there. It really does have to be upfront that for one of those mechanisms, the methodology has changed. It's not a it's not a small change. It's a significant one. Um, and so how many people were surveyed? So it was a phone survey. How many people? Because it was normally, when it was on the street, it was normally around five, the 500 mark. Uh, so the similar numbers uh, okay. from past, we'd still utilised uh, teams of people talking to people face to face. We so you just, still did on the street so in the CBD? That. We just had it on as part of our public consultation, um, have your say framework as well. So the vast majority of people still entered through conversation with, with individuals. So, Andy, you would have that separate data then, wouldn't you? Absolutely. 
So, I, I mean, just personally, I'd be interested in that to yeah. see what the people still, because the, the data on the street is comparative to since what we've been doing since 2014. So I'd really be interested to see those separated out. Yeah, we would be able to um, yeah. run, run some of that for you. Yeah. Um, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tooman. Yeah, just a couple of questions, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, page 14, paragraph 15. Uh, it says 40 per cent of people gave an answer to their primary concerns about safety during the daytime. Um, and then it follows on with 10 per cent mentioning traffic concerns and issues. Can we elaborate on those? Is this school parking or whatever the case may be? I'm not sure. That was, they were specific and out of the uh, central city safety plan perceptions. It was around anything to do with traffic as being under the free text commentary boxes. So what we've done is we've actually lumped them all together. There were uh, commentary about the shared oh, yeah. way, about speed, about uh, bicycles, about scooters. There was a range of road transportation related events which were all, all collaboratively put together. Okay, good. And they made up 10%. And then on page 17, which is your um, nuisance type behaviour, <coughs> halfway down there you've got car parking areas. Does this refer to car park buildings and off street parking? That's the HCBA one. That is yep. all car parking areas for uh, as, as they see it. This is, this is the business community doing their own survey amongst the business community. Yep. So, so does that include their on-street parking as well? I don't know what the new problem would be with it on-street. It's changed, very, changed almost very little in yeah. the four years of the um, survey. Yeah. You know, it's just that some of these um, parking buildings can be a little bit intimidating uh, at times. I, 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 I can advise that parking was not a over overly highly represented sure. in the overall perceptions um, free text commentary areas. Okay. Thank you. Councillor McPherson? Yeah, actually, Leo's touched on one of the points that I was going to ask about 15, the transport uh, traffic concerns and issues. Uh, so that's just in the CBD, because it doesn't make it totally clear that, and when we do the our bigger city-wide survey, we're getting traffic way up the top there. So I'm just clarifying that was literally within the pre CBD precinct or even more central than that. It's, it's specific questioning around the uh, central city day and or night. And they were, uh, there was a free text commentary. And one of the things was, can you give some reasons for your earlier um, scores or marks you've awarded? And then there was a free text area. And so all I've done is I've gone through and put together all of the categories which are similarly linked. So it, those, the 10% uh, were the transportation related ones. How far out from, say, Garden Place did those question, questions happen? They weren't, they weren't specific to a geographic location. They were just in the responses for the central city safety plan, uh, central city perceptions because it would be quite handy for us in the transport side of things to know if they were coming from areas, for instance, that had our 30k per hour speed, per hour speed limit on, uh, as opposed to, say, the north end of Victoria Street where it's 50 and we've had a couple of people killed in the, in the past, or, you know, just to know whether in people's perception there's a difference between some of those slower areas and the others? I'm not sure we I'm can... I'm not asking yeah, for now. Yeah. I'm talking about the future, yeah. sorry, Kelvin. So, yeah. yeah. And the other one was following Angela's point, and I think she was sort of spot on to when you change the methodology, you almost shouldn't have the answers in the same paragraph. They're totally separate, um, but would be quite have, would have been quite good methodology when you do a change to actually do a, a test your old way of a... You know, some with the new one and see whether they because you ca so. we can't tell. Yeah, I think that point can't tell been, anything about that, point's that been really. Made. And so yeah, we're still in questions, but that. But, yeah. but I, I, I know going forward, you say they're going to be the same, but there will be changes in methodology, and you have to do a way of checking the two against each other if you're 
putting them together like this. So your question is, can that be achieved? Yeah, it's just sort of, you do it. There's a scientific way of doing that, that testing a sample to see how, how the two correlate or don't. All right, I think that's good. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you. Anybody else wanting any questions? No, I don't see any. Therefore, the report is to be uh, voted on for um, just received. So we'll vote there. Oh, you did. You came up. Sorry. That was quick. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Paula. Yeah, just, I just wanted to touch on the uh, point, the question that Councillor Casson had about lighting. Um, and uh, the, I note that in, in number 14 on page uh, 172, um, it talks about the people feeling um, unsafe at night, uh, decreased from 62.6 down to 49.5% in the council survey. And uh, concerns about light in Garden Place and Civic Square aren't, aren't new. It's been a pretty consistent theme. And it's something that came up in Angela's um, safety, Central City Safety Task Force as well, and something that um, the task force wanted to try and do something about. And um, speaking to staff recently, uh, assessments are showing that the lighting in, in Civic Square and Garden Place is below par. It's not what it should be for a safe environment. So I just uh, wanted to mention that Councillor um, Ryan and I have been doing a bit of work on it and on Thursday intend to bring a proposal to, uh, we'll signal a proposal to the council for the annual plan to try and bring lighting up to speed um, in those two areas, Civic Square and Garden Place, for a pretty cost effective sort of sum, uh, which would be eligible for an NZTA subsidy as well. Um, and uh, you know, we feel for a reasonably small amount of money we could make a significant difference, uh, the council could, to the lighting in the central city, or well, in, in the, those two public spaces and subsequent perceptions uh, of safety. Don't know if Councillor Ryan wants to add to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we've got, I should have got a mover and a seconder before we went into debate, so just help me out with that. Councillor Taylor, you'll move. Yes? Councillor Taylor, you'll move that. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Casson. Thank you. It's moving second. We're still in debate. Um, apologies, Councillor Casson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, look, I walk through the C CBD um, daily, really, and uh, look, I have seen a a small improvement in the behaviour of our so-called vagrants and uh, the numbers. Um, and I think City Safe play a big part in that. But it is of concern, however, to me. Uh, to hear of residents increased levels of concern around safety perceptions. Um, I think we need to push on with the, um, uh, to promote the Your Help May Harm campaign, as uh, education of the public is required here uh, to get that through to them. Um, now look, um, if these people in town, our, our vagrants, are continually given money and food, uh, they will remain a problem and uh, their numbers will only increase. And you'll see that it's, it's happened in Auckland, it'll happen here. Um, the old um, uh, saying, if you leave cat food out in town, the cats will come, it's exactly the same with these people. If people continue to give them money and to give them food, they'll come into town whether they need it or not, because it's just human nature. They're going to get free money and they're going to get free food. We have a plethora of social service agencies here in Hamilton that can and do help our central city uh, problem people. There is no other way to describe them as a bit of a scourge in our city and, our, and now reaching out into our suburbs. So uh, we do have to do something about them. And I, um, I'd like to see the police take a tougher stance on them, uh, especially if they are uh, uh, committing offences against the um, Summary Proceedings Act, or the Summary Offences Act, sorry, or the Crimes Act. Um, there's stuff there for them because our uh, begging by law does not work. Um, there's absolutely no need for them to beg in, beg in New Zealand because, the, look, the amount of government and non-government organisations that we have do an amazing job with uh, our less fortunate. And uh, we do have a lot of people around here that can do that. And, and I know that people want to give food and money to people, but you know, if they want to do that, they should be doing that through uh, places like uh, the Salvation Army and other organisations that deal with these people. It's a safer way of dealing with it. Instead of approaching people and giving them money and food, they should do it through these organisations. Uh, we also need to have an upgrade in lighting in the CBD, especially Garden Place and Civic Square, to help with uh, safety perceptions. And we are lucky in Hamilton. We have something that no other city has, and that's city safe. So um, 
you know, for them to do, and they do a fantastic job with what they have. However, I think we do need to increase the funding for our city safe team so that they can provide um, more services within our CBD and outreach into the suburbs as well, because they do need a staffing increase if they're going to go out and deal with the people in the suburbs, because the vagrants in the city are now reaching out to the suburbs and they're at Rotatuna every weekend, three or four of them begging and uh, demanding money off elderly people, and the elderly people feel um, pressured into giving them money. So uh, we should be doing a little bit more with Ewa City Safe. Thank you. Thank you. Just a process point, I was, um, will that be like an action point, the report back on the uh, Lake Rotorua, Rotorua yeah, yeah. workforce February, and things? February, okay, thank it? you. February? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, Councillor O'Leary. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just, I wasn't going to say anything, but I feel compelled to just, um, as the chair of the People's Project Governance Group and the former chair of this um, Central City Safety, look, support uh, the work that Councillor Taylor and Hamilton are doing on the lighting. It's um, something that does need to be done. I just caution again um, and understand that the will around the table and in the community about addressing beggars uh, and nuisance beggars in our community. But I was recently in Auckland and I did a seven minute walk from the viaduct up to Queen Street and I am not kidding you, I walked past every three to four metres in that seven minute walk someone begging outside a shop, or well, they're all shops up there obviously, but we do not have a significant problem in the city. And I, I strongly, my strong advice of being the next to our, our um, fantastic staff who work in this area, I am the most experienced person with this issue, and I have read the research and, and done the work of, for years and years. I cannot support anything that will criminalise vulnerable people in our community. The bylaw does deal with nuisance begging, and we have seen the massive public outcry, particularly from our, um, our Māori communities in Tauranga, um, from concerned NGOs and community groups that work with these vulnerable people in Tauranga, when you hit this nut with a sledgehammer. Um, the Mayor was very keen on uh, progressing the Your Help My Harm campaign by paying for billboards around the city. But all that will do is criminalise vulnerable people and we cannot do that. And that is my strong um, uh, experienced advice. We have a lot of fantastic agencies and people um, and groups working on this issue, but it is not it is not a significant issue. We are far, far ahead, and I keep saying this in this debating chamber, that we have come such a long way with the incredible staff um, work that has been put into this area, the work of the men's night shelter, the women's refuge, um, all our ethnic groups out there on the street, the People's Project, the list is longer than all of our arms put together. Um, I understand the, the rhetoric and I understand that there are nuisance beggars out there. They, they are out there. But let's just keep our focus on the size of the issue. It is not significant. Hamilton is streets ahead of all other metro cities in New Zealand. And so I just caution that your Help My Harm campaign is a great campaign, but it has been a soft approach for a reason because we cannot criminalise vulnerable people. Cities around the world have done it, they've done it badly. And, you know, there are, there are more people in our city than just those that represent the faces that sit around this table, and I urge you to, as we move into the annual plan and we, we look to um, supporting the project that Councillor Taylor and Hamilton have done, or are working on, supporting possibly the expansion of City Safe. please members keep that in mind, that we don't know the stories of those people on our streets. We haven't lived their life. We don't walk in their shoes. But they are vulnerable people and they are part of our city and they deserve as much service by these elected members as possible and they deserve to not be criminalised just because they're vulnerable. Thank you. 
Yes, Mayor King. On that, Carissa, um, the Your Help May Ham, Harm campaign was about not giving to the vulnerable and not feeding their addictions. It was never about criminalising those people. Criminalising is, is a legal term for charging people. And okay. I, I don't... I don't um I don't think there is a point of order there. I think you've got two. I think she's agreeing with you in that respect, and she has an opinion on on how far you should go with um, that. How aggressive you should push a campaign, I think, is the point you're making around that. So you're saying. May ham harm campaign was never about charging people, Absolutely. which is what has to happen in a criminal process. I agree it's with pretty you. open and closed, and I support that. Pretty point. straightforward. I support that point, Mayor King. Thank you. Um, we will go to the vote. We had a mover and seconder, didn't we, in the end? Yep, thank you. All in, well, we'll go on the board. It's just as easy. Thank you. There we go. Pardon? The board. Yeah, I was going to do that, then I. The motion is carried unanimously. Okay, thank you everyone. Now we're on um, the uh, item number 11, which is... Hmm? Um, note, um, happy to move the staff recommendation with an amendment to C and D. Okay, so what we will do, because this is one you did speak to me about, is that we will take each of these separately, and as we come to them, should there be any other change or amendment, and you 40 said now, um, Councillor Hamilton, that you've got an amendment to C and D, so you'll first cab off the rank in that respect. When we get to those ones, we'll take them independently. But the questions will relate to the whole after we've had the report. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, we'll take the report as read, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, that was easy, wasn't it? We're going to, when we come to recommendations, we'll do them one at a time. Um, but questions for questions but, in the same way? No, no, just go for the report. Oh, okay. Any questions you have on any of the applications, we'll take those now. Thank you. Hang on, let me just push the right button. So, Councillor Tooman, you're first up. Oh, down where they want to store their little yachts. Is that fairly secure for those? Because um, they're pretty expensive, some of those toys. Yep. So most, mostly what they want to store in the tunnel is actually equipment for um, racing. Oh, okay. So it might be cones or markers um, in a rescue boat, but it does have gates on e either end of the tunnel, which we've, um, we've, we've fixed those so that this can be secured. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, Mangai Oli. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just two questions. The first is with the tunnel. Are there any health and safety issues concerned if that space is confined space at all? So we did have a structural engineer have a look at it, do a condition assessment, and um, they recommended to us that it was, um, it was safe to use as storage. And can you just explain, uh, thank you for that answer, can you just explain um, point, uh, paragraph 77 of the report to me, please? What does that mean? So 77 is in regards to the revenue that we collect from community occupancy for rental. Um, so with the recent review of the community occupancy policy, all the square metre rates were reviewed. And as a result of that, sorry, that, and that was actually part of the original policy. As a result of that, once all the new groups are paying new rental, um, the revenue will increase to 151,121, subject to the agreements um, in this report being approved. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the report. Can I just ask staff just to um, flesh out for me just the, the sort of methodology or thinking behind um, the terms f set out for the various organisations you know, such as five years for the, the Model Power Boat Association, three years for the karate, 
10 years for the uh, CAB and 10 years for the dance performance. What, what, what sort of fed into the decision to, to set those terms? So we do have maximum terms set out in the policy, which some of those are, um, max, three of them are maximum terms. So, so 10, 10 years? Yep. So 10 years is the maximum term if a group's in a council-owned building. And the, for a licence agreement, the maximum term is five years. And can I, can I ask you why you went for the maximum terms? For a particular group or for all? Yeah, for, for, for CAB, dance in particular. Yes, so we felt that um, CAB and the Waikato Dance Performance Trust um, were a good fit for those buildings. Um, they make really good use of the buildings and um, they offer a lot of community benefit in those spaces. So we saw no reason not to recommend a 10-year lease term. I mean, it's up to council if mm, they mm. want to support that. No, that's fine. I was just trying to get my yep. um, to 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 understand it because obviously the um, during the LTP there was discussion about um, Old St Peter's Hall, wasn't there? And um, so I just wondered, in the light of the fact that there was that discussion um, about whether or not it, it about you know, future sale on that, whether that would have influenced you to go for a lesser term than 10 years or? I guess the recommendation, Councillor, in, in terms of for the full maximum was that Council made the decision not to sell the building. Mm. And particularly both those groups uh, presented to Council with their concerns uh, around the sale of the building and Council um, supported, Medical. evidently supported mm. that. When we went through an expression of interest process a couple of years ago for those buildings for new lead tenants, these were the only two organisations that came forward um, through our conversations with many groups uh, to use the building. So again, that kind of supported the idea that not only are we getting good community use, not only are, is there historical linkages for both these groups within the building, but actually other community organisations see that as well. And so when the opportunity was for someone else to come in, it wasn't taken up, um, mm. you know, kind of long. So that kind of all supported the rationale for a, the maximum term. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McPherson. Uh, yes. Um, similar question to Jeff's about one in particular, but from maybe the opposite standpoint. The uh, Frankton Railway Institute Hall and the Karate Club, I'm all for giving um, sporting organisations good access to facilities, but many share their facilities in a, in a bookable sense, and some of them are long-term bookings and things like that. The concern, and I'm wondering how much staff have considered this, is the potential community use, because that hall has long been slated for potential community use. In fact, in my very first year in council, we had some major meetings in that hall, uh, community meetings, Gary, I think, came to one with me where we had no chairs and we all had to stand. <laughs> 70, yeah, about rates, remember? It was packed. Uh, um, get away. <laughs> True, nothing's changed. Um, so uh, I'm a bit worried that giving it to um, one group for exclusive use is going to almost cut off the chance that the community will get out of the habit of relying on it. And it, that hall was actually built for that community. It was part of the whole railway precinct and the, the, the original people who live around there, that was part of what they, they used for recreation and social and cultural events. And uh, it was a good fit. And we've always potentially seen that as a good fit. And I know it's only three years, but exclusive use, that's my worry. We agree with a lot of your sentiment there, uh, Councillor, which is why we landed on that three years uh, as in terms of in the conversation with both the aspirations of the group and thinking about how that building can be used for the benefit of that wider community. In terms of the exclusive use part, the uh, Shinjokai have been there since 2012 in this capacity, so we're not changing the current model for that. They already have other groups that they work with in that space and they are open to 
other community use. Uh, their concern is a little bit around making sure that people aren't um, leaving glass and uh, things that would, because they train in bare feet, there's always that kind of concern that alternative use looks after the space so that it's not uh, detrimental for their training. But they are open to other uses within the, other users within the group when it uh, works, and they do collaborate with a couple of others. Our three-year term in that conversation was there is potential other ways that this could be done by other organisations, and we haven't landed on that. Okay. And so rather than going year by year mm. and having this conversation, three years was a length of time to hopefully progress some of that wider conversation. But you're saying that if, for instance, say, Gary and I wanted to hold a public debate out there on rates again, <laughs> we, we, could, we could do a deal with them about using it if we didn't uh, smash the glasses over each other's heads or something? Absolutely. If you were controlled in the way that that happened, then yes, uh, they, they are very open to that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, there being none, we'll go to the recommendations one by one. The first is to is the New Zealand Motor Power Boat Association. Huh? Yep. Yes, we're going to put them up. Yep. Model, the Model Power Boat Association. Pardon? I was just asking Ryan if he's given his amendment to it. Uh, he's um, he's only seeking to amend the C and D. Yes. So I'm happy to second this one with Councillor Hamilton as the mover as it is. Um, sensitive to the the conversation around the duration. But anyway, Councillor Hamilton, you're the mover. Is there no amendments? No, so the mover, do you want to speak to it? Um, well, this is all four in terms of debate? Uh, no. N yes and no. It depends what your amendments to C and D are. I mean, you don't have to speak to it at all. You can just say, take it. Do you like it? Move it? I'll save for debate. Okay. All right. So let's have anybody who wants to debate the recommendation. Num this one. This one, the model boat. Nobody wants to debate it, Ryan. So unless you've got anything to say, we're going to put this one. Brilliant. Thank you. Let's go to the vote on this one, please, on the board. Thank you. The motion is carried unanimously. Okay. Now we'll move on to the um, karate in the Frankton Railway Hall. Uh, Councillor Hamilton is the mover. I'm happy to second, but listen, does anybody else who has a strong view? Okay, so this is... I'll just, uh, do you want to speak to this one in particular? I'll just say that um, I'm cognizant of the points that you make, Dave, around the term, and but, but also very, very keen as we go forward with these leases as they get renewed that we look at the best use and the best sharing of the space. I think that's something we've all agreed that we need to focus harder on so that somewhere down the line we've got the best activities and the best space as we go forward, but it'll take time to transition that. Happy to, happy to be the seconder, though. Anybody else like to speak to that? No. Oh, Councillor O'Leary. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just want to reiterate Councillor McPherson's point on this one. Um, the Frankton Neighbourhood Plan, which um, has not been deleted by this council, but has certainly not um, been a highlight either. It's still sitting there somewhere, uh, even though there are no printed books anymore. But we had... Um, we had identified in that plan the Frankton um, Railway Hall as being, as Councillor McPherson has pointed out, available uh, in the future for that community. And like Hamilton East, we, this city has two special character areas, Hamilton East and Frankton, and that is why those plans were created. Um, so I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable with the three-year term, but as the Chair has pointed out, at some point in hopefully the not-too-distant future, we will be looking at um, how, we, how we best rationalise and uh, all of these buildings, my particular, fo for the community groups, my particular focus, focus is in that some point in the future, the historical buildings that belong to the city are open, properly open for all public to use. Now, whether that means museums, cafes or um, 
uh, giving to trusts to look after things like that. That's what I would like to see. We have so few heritage buildings left in the city. I think it's a shame that they are, some groups in the city have exclusive um, rights to them. So I look forward to that body of work sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is no further, dis further discussion, so we'll go to the vote for this one, please. The motion is carried unanimously. Councillor Hamilton, for the next one, you are moving it with an amendment, and I haven't seen that yet, so I'll just um, wait and see what is up as to whether I second that or someone else does. So here it is. So please uh, note that it's a reduction. Is that the only change? The reduction is from 10 years to five years in term. I probably won't second that in that instance. Do we? It's a, it's a motion because the other motion wasn't up. Um, anybody? Um, oh, sorry, if you get a seconder. Sure. Is there a seconder? Seconder is Councillor Taylor, and the amendment is. And I'll second that. Thank you. Can I get some clarification from uh, Councillor Hamilton as to why he wishes to reduce it to five yes, years? Yes. Yep. I was going to get there. Yep. Um, yes, yeah, sure. Look, I don't want to relitigate the issues around the tenancy. I think we've we've had that debate, and I've got no no problems. I just think ten years is a little excessive, given that south end of the city uh, is potentially a changing landscape with the the demolition of the municipal pools. Um, five years or three to five years, I think, would be a reasonable term for um, certainty of tenure for those tenants. I think ten years ties us up too long and potentially there's the opportunity for them to renew at five years. It's similar to what we did with the um, celebrating age um, tenancy, where it just gives us flexibility. Okay, that, that's, that's great. So now we're into debate. You are the mover. Did you want to say anything else, or have you covered up in what you've said? Yeah. I'll save it for... Save it for your debate. Right of reply, brilliant. Okay, so is there anybody else who would like to discuss this one? Councillor McPherson. Look, I appreciate what um, Councillor Hamilton is saying about that. Um, and we've still got to finalise things with the pool anyway, across the road. But sometimes when you're on council, there are battles that are worth fighting and sometimes there are battles that are not worth fighting that are not worth the candle, and I personally think this is one of them. I've looked into the organisations down there, I've looked into them in the past, I've looked into them again and visited them and spoken to the community, and I think, to be honest, while technically, if you're looking at it as a desktop exercise, it's probably good to uh, move them on to somewhere else and things like that, I, I actually don't think it's good for those groups and it's not good for council's reputation to go there. It's not a battle we need to fight. Um, it's, uh, they're doing perfectly well in the position they're in there. It ain't broke. It's not something that needs fixing. Um, it's not something that's going to strategically alter the direction of the city in any uh, appreciable way, but it could be something that would appreciable, appreciably alter those individual groups' um, situations. So I think it's best left well alone, to be honest, and that's why I support the 10-year lease. Um, I, did, I was initially attracted to the idea, but when I went away from my desk and went and visited the organisation and thought about it, I came up with a different answer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. Councillor Taylor. Yeah, yeah, look, I, I respect that point of view, and it's, it's not die in a ditch material for me at all. But I do, I do agree with Councillor Hamilton that I think um, it just seems like an unduly long period for me and um, like we're almost um, unnecessarily locking ourselves into a, a long-term arrangement. Ten years is a long time, you know, I'll be heading towards 50 in ten years, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's a decade and, and a lot can change, an awful lot can change, and, and um, I still feel, I'm just not sure if it's good practice. Five years still gives a fair amount of surety for an organisation, um, but it also gives the council room to move should circumstances arise. So I do, I do support five years. Thank you. Councillor Casson. 
anybody who's fully aware of what um, Citizens Advice Bureau do would, um, you know, uh, would be uh, relatively happy with the 10 years. They've been there a long time. Um, and uh, they're also, when you went down, went down and spoke to them, they are close to the police station, they are close to the courts, they're on the bus route right there with the bus stops right outside. It's perfect for them. Um, and they've got uh, people that need their services can get their services relatively quickly. I know the police um, use them a hell of a lot um, and only just a short walk across the road and people who deal with the court system also have a very short walk to have uh, get help from the Citizens Advice Bureau. So, uh, yeah, I'll be supporting the amendment. Thank you. Um, just add a little voice of my own here. Um, I also support the 10 years because I know how difficult it is for any tenant in one of our buildings, especially if they're thinking of making, sometimes at their own cost, improvements to the space they work in. They invest money and time into that, you know, like um, they may improve uh, the use of the kitchen. They might need to put some paint up or um, improve a footpath or a part of the garden or some space within. And, and, you know, when you've only got a short lease, you ask yourself, well, will I even bother putting that liquor paint on? Um, you know, to what extent do I invest in keeping this space of ours to its top, top condition? But I do believe that when people feel they've got a long horizon, they take care of the building and they start to feel like it is a space for them to own for that period of time, and they take much better care of it. So that's the reason I'd support it. We'll go to the vote. Oh, sorry, Councillor Mallet. <coughs> oh, yes, of course. Yeah, thank you. Um, I support the um, the shorter period, uh, and as has already been said, that they, there's no nothing at the moment stopping that from rolling over at the end of five years. Um, but we do need to be aware that that is a part of town where there is a lot of change going on. It's very very close to the um, new theatre project, um, and who knows what's going to be required and what's going to be the optimal use of that land uh, in five well in five years plus one or whatever this day one five years plus one day. Um, so I think. Um, uh, yep, these are very, these are very, very worthy organisations, Citizens Advice and the Dance Studio. But there's a whole city we need to look at, um, and um, it is important, I think, that we take get take a balanced approach. And it would be terrible if we were five years plus one day, and suddenly that becomes a very important piece of land for another purpose. And we will then be uh, morally and legally obliged to um, prevent whatever project it is, and I don't even know what it will be, um, going forward. So I think we need to look after the city's interests um, as much, okay, we, we've just got to balance the city's interest along with the, the very valuable um, work that these two organisations do. And I've got great, um, I have great respect for what they do, so I'm not trying to un un undercut them, but I think we are going a little too far in balancing their interests ahead of uh, the overall city's interests. So I see a uh, five-year five lease as a fine compromise between the two. Thank you. <coughs> oh, Mayor King? Yeah, I just um, want to point out something that was said earlier, that we actually look after the buildings. So we paint them, we put the roof on, we do the floors, we uh, do the toilets, we upgrade them. So that's a cost to council that hasn't been put in this report, and that counts and that cost is substantial. Um, secondly, to that, um, um, there just seems to be some inconsistency that one group here has been given three years, another group's been given five years, and then these groups have been given ten years and as the custodians, if you like, of the building, um, it, it gives some control to us as to where the most suitable place is for people to be should, the, should a change be required. And, yeah, so that's... Thank, thank you, Mayor King. Just on that respect to that, you're not wrong, we do the majority of that, but quite often tenants do because they are required to maintain it. They do quite often do their own gardening, their own maintenance, their own painting, their own freshening and little bits and pieces and bring their own sense of um, love. And, and I know that some of them have bought smaller items of whiteware like microwaves and all sorts of other things. So they do do stuff in their own space and they're more likely to is my point. Second time I'm not around. Correcting the point that you said that we pay for everything, and I'm. We didn't raise a point of. We don't. Right. So, Councillor Henry, 
Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, I wasn't going to say anything, but uh, we, when it comes up to the cost of um, of these two organisations, I'm really a bit nervous now because. We've just approved $4.7 million for lights on the cricket ground, and then we're scribbling about a, a few dollars for these uh, worthy, worthy organizations. And uh, it, makes me, it makes me a little bit wild because uh, there we are, especially when it comes to, to women and um, girls and children and, and vulnerable people, we, we have got these major discussions and when it comes to rugby and cricket, I haven't seen one cricket player painting the cricket stadium or the, uh, one rugby player helping to, to mow the lawn on their, their million dollar lawn that we have to replace every couple of years or whatever. So um, yeah, I, I just, there, there's such a huge discrepancy and we're just, we're pouring money into stuff that we honestly, we, we don't think twice about. And I know we've got all these rugby players and cricket players and all these love ex whatever here. Um, but uh, honestly, I'm a bit pissed off now. So um, I'm going to go for the um, amendment. Thank you. I just have to say, I go the for amendment. the Yes, please, please uh, withdraw the swear word, but otherwise your sentiments are valid. But oh, what's the swear word? I'm sorry, I'm German. I'm not always sure which one is. Uh. Thank you. It's good to have passions, Ziggy. Just mind the little ones. That's annoyed is great. Great. Annoyed is a great word. Councillor Pascoe. Yeah, thank you. Um, Chair, look, I'm, I'm going to uh, echo uh, Councillor Casson's comments and add that very much down that end of town, it is kind of like a social services centre. You've got the police station, you've got the courts, you've got uh, eight, the age centre across the road, um, and you have got good bus stops, good connections, because a lot of the people who attend... Um, the, um, the um, uh, Citizens Advice Bureau don't have cars, do have diff or, or can't drive, so they do have difficulties in, in, uh, in, in uh, getting there. The meetings that I had with them during the long-term plan suggested that whilst they were very, very keen to retain the place that they were, there was quite a degree of flexibility in being moved if they had to move. And uh, I think that if we gave them a 10-year um, lease, as, we, as is being uh, recommended by staff, if there were circumstances that came about during that time, I'm of a mind that um, they would be open to some op options to uh, go elsewhere, particularly if those social services were moving and there's talk of moving the police station and, and a few other things which might all happen within that 10 year. 10 years. I don't see inconsistencies in the various terms. For example, the, um, the New Zealand Model Power Bait Association, that's not a lease, that's a licence. And I quite understand why three years would be appropriate to um, be a much lower term than perhaps the 10 years for the cab group, given that you know people do want to know. And I know that people still go around the corner here thinking that cab is still there. And I don't think they've been there for five or seven years. So, so I think um, having a permanent location is not only beneficial to them, as they have expressed in their presentation this morning, but also beneficial to members of the public who may or may wish from time to time to make um, positive contact with them. So I'll be supporting the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. No further discussion. We will go to the vote. Oh, right of reply. Thanks. Um, yeah, look, I agree with um, pretty much everything that everyone said. Really, this issue is about just giving us an out in five years' time instead of locking us into a potential uh, troublesome contractual arrangement. Uh, I agree with Councillor Dave. The situation is not broke. Um, but this just gives us an out. Um, we're talking about a Citizen Advice Bureau, which is serving a, a, rele a very relevant purpose. But what that might look like in the digital space in 10 years is anybody's guess. Why would we not just give ourselves a chance to recheck that in five years' time? I do think there's a huge inconsistency here. We're talking about a three-year karate hall, and Councillor Dave brought up the multi-use of that. Well, the Citizens Advice Bureau is only a single-use hall, 
um, and it's got 10 years instead of three years. So I, I do question the logic around some of the consistencies here from, from staff, especially given the um, sensitive nature of those two sites. I think as governors, we have to make a pragmatic choice. And if these arguments that uh, Councillor James and Councillor Rob talked about in terms of its benefits, if they're still there in five years, then we'd roll it over. Um, no question. This just is a sensible decision around governance and not tying ourselves into something that potentially could, could hurt us down the track. We've struggled to make commitments to three-year and five-year programs recently in this council, and yet we're very quick now to sign up uh, something for 10 years, which nearly didn't cross the line four or five months ago. Uh, Councillor Henry is way off track comparing this to, to rugby to a dance studio. It's not even the issue. We're talking about a five-year and 10-year lease, and not everything we talk about has to be sexist, Siggy. So hope, hopefully common sense will prevail. Thank you. We'll go to the vote, please. Um, on the, uh, there's no amendment because there's only. Oh, it's amendment. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. Which one are we That's right. We're voting on the amendment, which is the one that Dave McPherson and I. So we're voting on the amendment that Councillor McPherson and I put up, which is to stick with the ten years. Yep. The amendment is one, nine, four, four against. Okay, so now that becomes the substantive, and we're voting again on that same point of view. The amendment as a substantive motion is declared passed. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. That brings us to the last one, which is D. Ryan, you have uh, changed to this one. Uh, same as oh, and, so. and I'd be happy to second that. Sec oh, you second. Do uh, you want to second? That's fine. You do that. It's fine. <laughs> have we got a seconder for... Thank you. Councillor Taylor is seconding Councillor Hamilton's. Okay. Councillor Hamilton. Nothing more to say. Similar reasons, I guess. Okay, uh, Councillor McPherson. Yeah, uh, there were some good speeches from both sides in the last debate, but actually I thought Siggy's was right on the button, uh, unlike um, Ryan, who didn't think it was on the button. Um, the, you think about the surety that we give the organisations that occupy Northern Districts Cricket and Waikato Rugby Union and things like that. It's not that they're men's sports or anything else. I, mean, I might go also go for Waikato Netball at, out at Minogue Park. We give them much longer surety so they can afford to raise money and make changes to their premises and things like that. Um, I've, throughout, throughout my time on this council and beforehand, I've been involved in some NGOs around the place, a couple of them in Hamilton. And uh, in both cases, they lease uh, council land. And to have a short term, uh, which I would certainly regard five years as short term um, occupancy, whether it's on a lease or a license basis, would have meant that neither of them would have invested and gone out and got community support, basically, was how they were able to invest in improving the area and actually making a real go of it. If you're only, you, th you need to put yourselves in the shoes of the NGOs and the volunteers that largely that run them. Uh, five years is nothing in terms of uh, an investment that uh, re gives return to the community. We're very lucky, and I think we'd all subscribe to this, that these community organisations are working for the city on the smell of an oily rag. If we had to mount those activities ourselves as a council, it would cost us 10 times as much, probably. So we should be thanking them by saying, you can have a permanent lease. I personally think in some cases 10 years is too short, but that's not what we're debating here today. That is the policy. And um, 
in the dance studio's case, they've, I think they've proved their case to councillors, the benefit that they give back to the community. We did have worries about them being a private organisation and competing with private organisations. I, I think on reflection and on investigation, that's not the case. And in any event, they provide a huge benefit at a pretty low cost to hundreds, if not thousands, of young people. And we've sort of seen some examples of that. And I think um, more power to their arm. Let's find more places for people, for groups like that to operate from. Let's support them because it's a low cost to us as a city and to the ratepayers um, in terms of providing the facilities and for them to go and operate them. That's a very low cost for the ratepayers and a very high benefit for the community. And I think that's the sort of thing we should be supporting as far as we can go. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. Councillor Pascoe. Yes, I just want to add very briefly, I think in this case, there is evidence certainly from the visit I did to the uh, Dance Performance Trust uh, during the long-term plan that they have done some improvements inside the building. My recollection was that they have improved the kitchen and that they have um, done a, quite a significant amount of work on the floor in terms of the painting and polishing and whatever else is necessary. So I suppose in their case, um, the 10 years is a little more critical than it might have been to CAB because uh, they have got some investment that they would need to leave behind if the lease was not renewed. Um, so I'll be supporting the, uh, the amendment again in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Before you write a reply, Ryan, um, I'll um, just... Can I ask that who paid for the new floor? Who put, who put down the new floor? Well, we're not... In, no, well, because... But no, we've just been... No, OK, do, no, point with all due respect, because you, you would say, and you have done when you've chaired meetings, that we're in debate and there'll be no further questions. So that's where we're at. Sorry, you can't. Point of order and accuracy. Why? Who said what? What's your point of order? The member said that they paid for the new floor. All right, if it's a matter of clarity. Uh, the floor was polished. It's not a new floor. Yeah, at whose cost? Oh, I'm not sure. OK, thank you. We can find that out. Do you know? Don't know for sure, but I think it would have been us. Yeah, thank you. Okay. It was, because I've seen the documentation. OK. They told me. I, I was really just echoing what yeah. I was told yeah. when I'm, I went there. Uh, and it wasn't a matter of replacing the floor. It was a matter of maintaining, maintaining the, floor, the floor, which is what I said in debate. Yeah, so I get that. Look, I think, I think that's been answered, and it doesn't add to, add to the um, debate at this time. Um, before Councillor Ryan has his right reply, I'd just like to, add, to say my point of view, which is just which I'm not going to go on too long about, because I'm going to say... Um, I totally agreed with the um, debate of Councillors McPherson and Councillors Pascoe. If you go into that building and you see what they have done and how very carefully they look after that historic building, it just looks like a gem in there. It's really, really nice what they've done. And I know they're in conversation with the Citizens Advice Bureau as to whether there can be some shared use of the kitchen and whether they can open up that space and do a little bit more there. And I think that could be a win-win too. So that's why I'm happy to support the amendment. Councillor Ryan. Look, I totally agree with Councillor Dave and Rob again. All the arguments make perfect sense. Again, I just caution it, if it's still relevant and true in five years, then we can roll it over. We're just locking ourselves in here. Uh, they're paying 12.5% uh, of a commercial rate, and in 10 years' time, our market's rate will potentially be 50 to 100% more, and they'll still be paying 12.5% of that. So why not review it in five years' time? Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the vote. Uh, for, the, um, for the amendment, which is Councillor McPherson and Councillor Henry, to retain it at the 10 years. That's what we're voting for. The amendment is carried, nine to four, four against. Thank you. And now the um, amendment is a substantive, and so we're voting again for the 10 year period. The amendment as a substantive motion is declared carried. 12 for, 1 against. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll now... We 
trying to get through the day for this workshop, so we'll keep going for a little bit. If this item goes go too long, we'll take a stretch shortly, but um, I think we can get through. Um, item 12, which is the community development on page 70. Thank you. Good afternoon, thanks for having us. Um, always good to be here. Um, just to start, I'd really like to I'd really like to express my appreciation for the support and participation from everyone around this table um, in the development of this strategy, um, right from the outset in terms of making time to talk with Dr Gatenby about your views of the unit through to the participation in the workshops and then also to those councillors who gave me um, really good feedback on the draft. Um, the support and participation has been really appreciated and I think that the outcome that we've achieved has been much more robust as a result of that discussion, so thank you for that. Um, my next point is that this is a strategic plan, it's not a unit work plan. So what we are looking for from governance today is a clear strategic direction and what that gives us is a mandate to go away and work with staff within the unit on the detail of how this is delivered. So we are cognizant of the fact that council want a greater level of oversight on the work of the unit and that, um, that you also want updates from the sectors. So that's why we have incorporated the regular reporting to committee and I anticipate that the informal relationships between the unit and councillors will con continue to grow as they are at the moment. So you're happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Sorry to push my discussion button. Mangai Oli. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you for the report, Debbie. Just having not been involved in the process for the development of the strategy, coming with relatively um, fresh eyes, and just wanted to ask a couple of questions there. Um, so that um, table on page 119, that lists the cost of the community development service model of approximately 3.1 million per annum. Sorry, can you just repeat the last part of your question? Sure, the cost that's listed on page 119 of the in-house service community development model, is that the cost, is it? Correct, that does include overheads and also community grants. Okay, and then reference um, page 139, para 14, the statement that's made there of over 60% of Hamilton's communities live in 40% of the most deprived areas. Is that with regards to victimisation or is that as a generic uh, percentage across the city? It's a generic percentage, yep. Okay. Um, so in terms of um, the strategy with regards to bullet point three on page three, which talks about specific neighbourhoods that have been identified for focused neighbourhood development. What neighbourhoods are those? And given that you haven't developed the operational plan yet, what type of resources are kind of ballpark figure for being allocated towards those? Yeah, so um, we had to make some decisions around... Sorry, can we just catch bullet point three on page three of which... Of the strategy. Page Thank you, because there's some um, couple of attachments just trying to get to the right page. Thank you. So, so Dr Gatenby made a, a range of recommendations in terms of how we would develop our strategic plan. So we had to make, as we analysed the information more, we had to make some decisions about the approach that we were going to take. And in the end, we would have landed on that we would mostly take an issues-based approach because we felt that those issues were going to also... Um, address those things that are occurring in our vulnerable communities rather than tying it to a specific neighbourhood. But what I'm saying, I guess, is that within those issues, I would expect that our vulnerable communities are addressed, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess the question I really wanted to ask is, so what are the, the tangible outcomes that will come from the strategy, particularly in those areas yeah. of high social economic deprivation, and an assurance that there will be actual tangible outcomes coming from the strategy? 
Yeah, so following the meeting today, there will be a process with individual staff to develop outcomes for each of those outcome areas. So the idea is that we would be developing portfolios for staff so they'd have responsibilities. So part of our connected program is we each staff member has a strategic performance template and they have 12 month outcomes and then three monthly activities which are then reviewed every three months. So through that process we would be um, working with individual staff to make sure that there are very concrete outcomes and that's part of the reason why we wanted to develop the strategic plan so that we could actually embark on that work and give a greater direction to the staff in the unit. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mangai Tapura. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, page one three six. Just understanding what a what virtual um, means. Um, so what that is referring to is that um, they wouldn't necessarily be physically located together as a team or be in a reporting structure, but that they, it, they would form a team from a variety of places around the organisation. Okay, thank you. So, and then my next question is, have we considered that actually, um, I think it's great that you've got tangata whenua there, but have we considered that the input that would come under tangata whenua actually sits right across all of the other ten um, items, possibly even nine? Absolutely. So, um, the discussion with the team um, to date has been that there is considerable overlap amongst all of them, so I would expect that they would be working together to address the issues across, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, it's, so when I say that, if we consider that um, you know, you've got the housing, the relationship with Iwi there, uh, the environment, you know, the, the Waikato Tainu plan, but also just wanting to check that, um, that there's also the Ngāti Haua environmental plan that's yet to be lodged with Council on if there's consideration to that plan coming at all. Sorry, can you just repeat? There's, so there is another iwi environmental plan, which is the Ngāti Haua um, environmental plan that's yet to be lodged with Council as a document. Yep. And uh, Just checking to see if there's any knowledge of that plan coming in at all, or if the, you, you, they're aware of it. Um, I don't personally have okay. knowledge of it, but um, yep. now that you've mentioned it, I'll make sure that that's included in with the uh, sustainability stuff. Yeah, excellent. Um, also, we're talking about what the staff are going to be mandated to go away and, and have a look at, and uh, it would be great to see um, the how we're articulating the inclusion of Pacifica in one of those 11. Are we going off that the, uh, and it's projected to be the population on the rise, because if that is the case, then we should also include something for the Asian population, because they're on the rise as well. But the, what, what's the intent behind that? Yeah, so um, there was a number of sort of criteria that we kind of used to um, kind of break down the outcome areas. So some of it was around what we already cover. So yeah. we know that um, the Asian population is covered already by our um, ethnic. Um, also, we looked at what um, projects are already taking place within the community. So, um, we want to use a community led development approach, which means that um, we're working with the community's existing visions and aspirations. And we felt that be, um, because of the Cote Pacifica focus at the moment on a Pacifica hub, that um, there is some significant work already happening within that community that we can participate in. Um, we also took into account that our Pacifica community is a vulnerable community and that they do need um, that additional support. Excellent, thank you. Please consider that we have civic engagement um, at the beginning and the, the reason for that, and hopefully it's something that will be considered, is that the, one of the greatest th things that we can do for our people is to enable them to have a say or participate in decision-making processes. So we're just straying a little bit into debate. Yep. Happy to hear yes, your comments, yes, yes. but maybe at that point... It's kind of a question, Madam Chair. Was it? Um, so I would expect... So the work of the team is twofold, and I did say that in the report. Mm -hmm. So they are expected to be community-facing, but there is a lot... You know, I'm also expecting that they spend a large part of their time actually building capacity within the organisation. Yep. So they have really good networks and good relationships um, with community organisations. 
organisations and we want them to build the capacity of the rest of the organisation to be able to work in a similar way and to develop relationships and um, let the community voice yeah. sort of come through in council decisions more than it does at the moment. Excellent. Thank you. Questions? We'll go in. Oh, OK. Thank you. Um, just very quick, and it probably won't be quick, what's the objective of this? The objective of the strategic plan? Yes. Is it the purpose to seek a recommendation to Council for the approval of a draft community social and development strategy? Blah, so blah, there's blah. two purposes. So one is to provide strategic direction for the work of the team, and the other purpose is to provide for the wellbeing of the city. So what we're here today is for you to give us that strategic direction, and the discussions to date have been around what are our priorities for the wellbeing of Hamilton, and how will we prioritise those? OK, going through the document, it seems to be lots and lots about a delivery... Well, there's talk of a delivery... Me well, that doesn't use the term delivery mechanism, but it's talking about whether or not people should be in the community Questions, or blah, please. blah, blah. Hmm? Questions, please. Yeah, I'm getting there. Um, so is that something we're trying to... I'm not sure I understand your question. Sorry. You're OK, so you've given us uh, example, cost examples of um, if you've got a person in the community or not in the uh, Wherever that grid is where the... Um, the pricing was. Um, oh, there it is. Councilor, Page um, 119. Uh, costings for community development service models. So this is, you're costing out some um, service models for us. And there's different ways of doing it. Status quo, located ge geographically, blah, blah, blah. What, what, what is the goal of community development? Where, and and where, where are the targets and how we know we've got there? And how, why, why haven't we achieved it previously because not we spent huge amounts of money on it for decades so uh, answering your first question there councillor the attachment one is uh, dr bev ganaby's report that helped the conversation of should we contract out our community development services okay so, so sorry so so that that was part of my question was uh, yeah. Is so, this something that tells us what the, our goal is, or is it how? What's the best mechanism to achieve the goal? And that's so. Attachment one mm. was the work that was done during the ten-year plan process to answer that question of the model of delivery: should we be in-house or should we look to do something else? When uh, when council agreed in April that the report was received and that we should stay in-house as a unit, part of the direction at that point was then let's uh, be a little bit more strategic in the way that the unit works and okay, just, do that sorry, in collaboration. Sorry, so does that, mean, does that make that decision that we made back then, does that make this um, graph redundant? Correct. Uh, okay. this, that's, uh, I guess, the history of this conversation over the last 12 months. Okay. So that's showing uh, Dr Gannonby's report and how that influenced the decision, to which then went on to our, our workshop that we had uh, with councillors a couple of months ago onto the current strategic plan, which is attachment three. Okay. So where, where's the big goal that we're trying to, what are, what are we trying to achieve with this? So within the strategic plan, there are three goals? Yep. Have you got that in front of you? No. Page 145. I mean, basically what it comes down to is there are two key goals, right? So one so, of the sorry, goals... Sorry, are, are the goals diverse communities, places and people, and community-led engagement, are they? Correct. So what we're trying to do, really, is we're trying to build the capacity of our community to engage meaningfully with council and improve council's ability to engage meaningfully with our community. And the other part of it is to address significant social issues that are, you know, that are part of the wellbeing of our city. Mm. Okay, so goal number one, diverse communities. Hamilton's diversity is celebrated. That's not a goal, that's just a slogan. How, how, can, you, uh, how, can, you do, how can you set up a, perp, a stream of work and spend other people's money to try and achieve diversity is celebrated? So you can speak against that in your debate if that's how you feel, I think. No, sorry, question, I'm asking, I'm, sorry, I'm asking a staff member how, they achieve, how they're going to achieve that goal, how they're even going to measure that goal, and how can they justify spending millions of dollars uh, uh, driving towards it? 
if can you, can you give me some? Can you, excuse me, I think Councilor I'm doing my job as an elected member, scrutinising the work the staff plan, are putting before us. We will be directing the spend of money as governors. I don't think it's fair to put onto staff how can they justify the spend. We adopt the strategic plan I'm, and they deliver it. But I will let Debbie talk to the question that you've asked in terms of how, what are some of the outputs and outcomes that you're going to cover off to deliver those three goals. Okay, so the first goal is talking to the fact that we have a diverse community. Okay, so we have accessibility um, issues in our community, we have a range of um, ethnicities and cultures, and that those people need um, sometimes different types of support or different types of communication and able to participate in a civic life. Does that make sense? The goal is to even the playing field so that everybody has the same opportunities to participate in society meaningfully. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? I'm, I'm happy to, to, yeah, yeah, to yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. this with you offline if that's helpful to you. Okay, well I just want, I want, these, these, I want these questions answered in, in public. So, places and people. Mm -hmm. Well, we work in partnership to achieve locally owned visions and goals. Yes. That again is just Question. waffle so, with all so, due so respect. So how if, are you going to measure that? So if you recall from the workshop around mm -hmm. what community-led development is, mm -hmm. so it is about that we don't go in as a council and say we're going to solve this problem for you. We mm -hmm. think you're deficient and we're going to solve a problem. We're going to work with communities to, with, their with their own visions and their own goals to help them solve their own issues. Have we not done, done that before? We, we do that now. So we work in collaboration and we work with the communities to resolve the issues that are important to them. That is another one of our goals. So what that means is that we stretch the amount of dollar that we have by working with organisations and agencies that are there to improve the social outcomes for our city. OK. Do you think that this is an overlap over what central government does? I, we work in partnership with central government. So is it, is it better that we work in partnership with local, uh, central government or we say, no, we'll give, up, give it up and you guys can do it? Isn't, aren't you better to have to one organisation doing the, doing the work? That way you don't have miscommunications, you don't have problems Th with That would be for this council to decide. That's right, it's for council so, to decide. So the mandate for yeah. me is to deliver a community development service mm -hmm. for the city. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing. Yep. If this council decided that they did not, no longer wanted to work in partnership with central government, that would be a decision for you to make. Yeah. Okay. okay, and, that, and those, are, and so those are the sort Councillor of things Mallard, I'm trying to determine here. Councillor Mallard, is that, please listen respectfully. I'm just going to ask you something. You, could, please you bring... could be respectful of my ability to, and, and obligation to ask questions of staff to identify er <coughs> errors or miscalculations. Please let me finish. We are really pushing on time for a workshop as well. I would like to offer you the chance to give your two topmost questions that you've got remaining, and then we're going to move on to debate and move through the item. So two questions only remaining, please. Okay. Where has this worked? It has worked all over the world and all over the country. There are multiple examples of where community development works effectively. So give us two examples. Well, if you want to look at an example within the country, look at Christchurch. They have a very, very effective community development service, and since the earthquake, they have invested a whole lot more into that because it, may, it is shown to create much more resilient communities that are more effectively able to respond to emergencies and other issues. So is, is it possible to have any measurable outcomes? How do we know that's better than what it was before, or how do we know it's better than what we've had? Now? I mean, they've had an extreme... This is your last uh, question. An, ...an extreme event, of, obviously, down there. So re recovering from an earthquake... So, so there are lots of data sets that we can look at to mm. measure outcomes. It, mm. it, measuring wellbeing is challenging, and it's something that even our Treasury is still trying to grapple with at the moment, but there are data sets that we can draw on to measure whether we've made progress. And so those are data sets that we will be drawing on and bringing to you for comment and to look at. So we haven't even got those sort of data sets in here. Th those, those are not considered in this? There's no goals in this? I mean, so, uh, the, the, okay. the goals, big your pardon, the goals the were those three... The questions are going on. I asked you to get to the last question. You, you've had it answered. You can talk into debate how strongly you feel about this report at that stage. Thank you. Is there anybody who hasn't had a question answered that would like to... No. 
Therefore, we are going to go into moving. No, no, no. I gave you plenty of opportunity to have more questioning than anyone else. You can debate, though, freely. So let's go to the recommendation. I'm happy to move. Is there a seconder? Councillor Casson. Thank you. We're now in debate. Who would like to speak to the item? I'll start by, sorry, thank you, Ryan, but I'll start by being the, uh, since I'm a mover and just say, um, personally, a massive uh, congratulations to Debbie and her team, Andy and, um, and Bev and everyone else who is leaving, you know, the, for the work that you've done behind this. And thank you to all those councillors who gave up time to go into the individual sessions. I think what we've landed on, you know, there'll be bits and pieces where we all wish it said a little bit more or a little bit less, because that's always what it's like when you're writing um, strategy um, together. But I like it. I uh, Just the only um, thing that I keep my um, eye on is how we improve the interface between our communities and governance. And we talked quite a lot about that, how we... Um, get a freer line of sharing from governance to the grassroots communities and also from the communities up so that we can truly start to do the co-led development, which, as Councillor McPherson mentioned yesterday, was quite... Oh, yesterday, it's earlier today, was quite evident in the, in the uh, Rotatuna visit, that kind of approach, how we can do more of that because it's better for Council. So um, just thank you. Please pass on our thanks to Bev and to the rest of your team for the work. Well done, and I've been happy to move it. Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, look, just echo um, um, Councillor Southgate's comments. I know this has been a big project for you guys, and um, I think you've done a really good job of distilling what are quite intangible uh, aspects and elements, and uh, have distilled it down to those 11 key roles. And I also think that the way you've identified those goals and outcomes is a really good way to bring visibility across those issues and uh, as you talk about identify those gaps and uh, and those sorts of things in those 11 areas so um, yeah no, I think well done and look forward to um, seeing this having uh, beneficial tangible results in our society thank you uh, Marai Tapora thank you madam chair um, I'm a big fan of community um, development because it should always come from the ground up, the community led. But one of the other important things about community development is actually building social capital um, out there and enabling communities to eventually do things for themselves. So I think that should be always an underlying goal of anything that we do there. So connected communities, are probably more safer communities, and all the other things that we talked about in the perceptions survey um, this, this morning. And I think we really need to consider how the plan actually enables the social capital to be built and what we're doing to really just bring people um, together. Also that we look at how we honour the community priorities and that they do actually come from the community and that we're not imposing our um, alpha card or our thoughts on what they actually need. So I'm glad that you've, you've raised that. Um, Debbie. So also around community development is essentially a call to action, again on some of the points that we raised this morning about determinants of wellbeing and tackling issues such as um, poverty and, and homelessness. Um, again I reiterate that around the, it's great that we've got Tangata Whenua in there, but you know, we need to think about how we can incorporate Tangata Whenua voices um, right across the um, 11 priorities there, because one of the concerns that I do have is if we just keep it at Tangata Whenua, then we can actually create a silo thinking in, um, around that when we're trying to achieve quite the opposite with that, even with the goal of visibility, it's easy to, to be siloed in there. And just around the civic engagement, consider that that's probably one of our, um, our higher priorities to actually get people... If we talk about community development, then we want them to be um, have that civic engagement for them to be enabled to come and have their say and participate in things that will ultimately shape their communities and the way that their families and themselves interact with their community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor McPherson. 
Thanks. Look, uh, following on from Tapora's excellent speech just then and the others beforehand, I would like to say express my support for this plan. It's a high-level strategic plan. I don't necessarily agree with all of the individual projects and outcomes that might come out of it, but then I'd be very surprised if any one person did agree with 100%. That would probably mean that it was a pretty bland, boring plan and wasn't challenging anyone, actually. So I, it doesn't worry me that it's not exactly how I would have drawn one, and I think that's one of the important elements in a community, in community-led development, as they now call it. I still call it community development. That's just the latest buzzword for it. Um, and one of the things I always think is that councils and other governments don't have all the answers. Many of the answers are in the communities that, uh, that, that you're supposed to be serving in elections every three years isn't democracy. That's just one part of democracy. The other part of it is, is heavy community involvement in decision making and in resource provision and in using the resources and that sort of thing. And you get that, you get that sort of in community engagement when the community has good buy-in to the activities and the projects and the things that are going on in their patch. And uh, what I like about um, community development is that it's, it starts from the local. I've been involved um, for 20 years or so in the Western Community Centre, and uh, that's got state-of-the-art premises for a community centre. Or well, did a few years ago, maybe they probably want to upgrade it now. Uh, and that was designed by the community, the fundraising was done by the community, the council was called on for top-ups, not for start-ups for that. Uh, it was entirely that community's idea. It's heavily used by the community, from little kids at the treats of the park when 5,000 of them turn up each year, right through to the seniors program that they run and everything in between. And uh, that's not all of community development, that's one side of it. You know, the, the government departments use it, police use it, uh, the uh, local people who want to run a campaign for slow speeds in their street use it. Um, you know, there's heaps and heaps of good examples of community development around the place that don't rely on council to take the lead. What they do, do rely on is support at times from council where it's appropriate and necessary. And that's where I think um, you know, one of the things that I liked about this plan was it talked about which areas you'd get into to support people, what are the key strategic areas we should be um, putting some effort into to make sure that the community's successful in those areas. And I think this is a, a good start and I'm sure there'll be more to come in future. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. Mangai, Holly. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Look, I'll speak in support of the uh, of the strategy. Um, coming in, as I said before, late in the piece, can see that the uh, the journey that you have been on. I think when I first uh, read uh, the strategy, um, it was I found it quite generic. But then looking at the uh, supporting documentation that informed the development of the strategy, relatively uh, comfortable with where you're going in terms of creating a four-year strategy for a um, considerable amount of um, resource for community development. Uh, you know, very passionate about community development and whether it's community-led engagement or, you know, um, community development um, supportive um, of that trust staff to operationalise the strategy and hearing clearly that um, uh, the Runanga is particularly interested in uh, tangible outcomes for communities of need, specifically seeing allocation of community resources to those communities. and. Um, is championing the cause there and in doing so harnessing the, um, the spend of central government agencies, holding them to account and also bringing in NGOs. So, yep, look forward to uh, its development and particularly uh, when the, uh, the KPIs come back for reporting. Thank you very much. Councillor Mallett. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't support this, not because I don't... Uh, uh, desire for great outcomes for our community or anything like that, but I think this is just going to be an absolute and utter waste of um, public money. These are the same people we're trying to help and we're going to take their money for them so that they can achieve, so that Hamilton's diversity can be celebrated while we enable our communities to reach their aspirations. We can work in partnership with locally owned visions and goals. We, su we support the community's ability to actively engage in council decision making. Those, someone, pe people have talked about beneficial and tangible results. There's nothing tangible about those. Those are all waffly. There is nothing there that is concrete that can be realisable. Um, and 
having been to the um, workshop we had over at the uh, WinTech, um, all I could think of was um, this was a ma massive, massive overreach by our organisation, or one part of our organisation, trying to um, address concerns that they couldn't accurately articulate, that they didn't have a plan to achieve, and I've, nothing that I've seen in here um, allays any of those concerns. So I'm, I'm concerned that I, I, the, 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 the high-level goals are certainly laudable, and no one could deny that, but the approach to trying to address them, I think, is far, far too centri uh, uh, driven by central government, local government, and not enough from the uh, community itself. Um, so I cannot, uh, in good conscious, conscience, uh, support any spending on this sort of development. Councillor Pascoe. Thanks, Chair. Look, I'd also like to congratulate um, staff and, and Bev on the report, and more so on the fact that we all had an opportunity, or should I say opportunities, at various times to contribute to the, to the development of this. Um, I see it a little bit like a, a district plan um, that's building on uh, creating or, or adding to our community so that it's more resilient. And I think if you follow some of the comments that Councillor Dave made, um, there will be um, there will be pickups, there will be wins, and there will be there will be opportunities that the community won't want to pick on or won't want to pick up on. And in that case, we'll know pretty quickly uh, whether or not uh, some degree of tweaking is required, as there is often on and district plans to make changes so that the, um, the uh, uh, plans stay on course to deliver uh, good, positive, measurable outcomes to the community. So I think this is a really good start. We've got, um, we've got building blocks on it underneath. We know that, we know that it's not always going to be, um, uh, everything that we do is not going to lead to a, uh, a win but we know that we're heading down a pathway where we can communicate with the community and we can get um, runs on the board, not only within the organisation, but also within the community. Thank you. Thank you. No more debate. We will go to the vote, please. Motion is carried. 11 for, 1 against. I'd like to go, uh, just two things. Um, the um, briefing that's after this has been postponed till Thursday to because um, it needs a good amount of time attached to it. I'd like to go straight into the item, but I'm going to take a three-minute comfort stop. And then we've got our last item of the day.